Hey, everybody, welcome back. I am Emily Moyer. This is Strange Mosaic, and we have an awesome new guest today that I'm very excited about. But before we do that, I just want to remind everybody that if you are watching this on the Off Planet Media YouTube channel, please also go over and subscribe to the Emily Moyer YouTube channel. All of my work appears there and it'll always appear there first. And now let's get on with it. All right. So as most of you know, I've been, um, I love doing dot connecting of all sorts, but I've been fairly hostile to anything Q related. Um, I've been interested in things like some of the points from Tartaria and issues with time travel, but I've been hesitant to go down any of the Q rabbit holes because I don't like the Trump is wonderful, he's going to save the world narrative that's attached to it. But um, when I'm being honest to my tracking and pattern matching skills, if some things pop up that I have to acknowledge, then I have to acknowledge them even if it's taking me into territory that I'm hearing danger, danger, don't go here, you're getting caught in a trap, I have to go and take a look. And the uh, person's work who sort of brought me to a place where I'm willing to consider something that I had sort of cast off as ridiculous before was this gentleman who's with us today. He is the host of Radio Tartary, now Radio Kitai, Victor Buge, is that how you say it, Buge? Yeah, Buge? that's, that's that's a long way in terms of American pronunciation of my name. Yeah, very good, very good. All right, yeah. Victor Buga, welcome to Strange Mosaic. Nice to see you. Thank you very much. I'm excited to be here. Um, I, I love how this isn't, you know, this is a little more sensitive because, like, you, you haven't gone into the Q stuff yet, and here am I trying to, you know, bring people to it from another perspective. So it's a little, it's exciting for me because I haven't done this before, you know, trying to, to go into other pastures because I've been, you know, with my people and we have been, you know, isolated because I knew that what I was doing was a little bit, you know, controversial even for our community, right? Um, but I think that I'm ready to, to lay it all out now. Um, yeah, so here I am. All right, awesome. Well, I'm glad to have been sort of, it doesn't seem like you've done too many other interviews in alternative media, so I'm glad to have kind of snatched you first because Regardless of whether the Q thing is, is a nothing burger or the total something burger, your pattern matching skills, your ability to recognize uh, things that seem disparate but are very connected is undeniable. So if it isn't, you know, if it doesn't pan out in this uh, stream of data, I'm sure it will pan out in others. So I'm super excited to make your acquaintance anyway. Um, before we get started, I just want to ask you um, kind of what's going on where you are. That's kind of been something I've been doing with everybody on this show lately because we talk to people from all over the country and all over the world. You're not an American, even though you say you are by heart. Um, but yeah. how, is it, how is it living where you are? Like what is going on there? Denmark is this ultra liberal country. We could call it like Hillary Clinton country. Like they all love her. Like. Uh, the media is just, you know, repeating CNN. Uh, it, it's really, you know, as a like objective study into propaganda and just following a bigger dog and what it's really interesting that markets because it's just like a banana state in that sense. I love my fellow people, but they are a little bit on the slow side when, when it comes to, you know, standing up for your rights. Um, you know, they just accept no second amendment rights. Uh, they think it's ludicrous that people should have guns and, you know, it's there. So it, it's at that level and it's, it's tough sometimes to be, you know, on the other side of that spectrum, even though I'm an educated philosopher. So I don't always, you know, I'm not that binary in terms of left and right. I always try to be more centered and just look for what do I think is the best argument and you know, irrespective of left and right. And this Q thing started out for me as I got this impression that it was all right, you know, mm -hmm. right side of the aisle. And I fought that for a while until I really went into the Q drops. And then I, I saw what Q was posting in terms of left and right. And I found all these drops saying that this is not about politics. This is not a left and right issue. It's a truth issue. It's a an awakening issue. It's a, it's a, a middle pillar issue was what I got from it. Ah. And, uh, I thought, and I thought to myself, middle pillar, well, middle pillar in astrology and symbolism is Saturn. So I thought to myself, well, is there anything particular Saturnian about Q? And that was where it all started. 
and I knew Saturnian symbolism pretty well from having listened for years to Santos, Bonacci, but also particularly a woman called Lavette on YouTube, who has, uh, who's really a powerhouse in astrotheology. And she really taught me the hidden sides of Saturnian symbolism. It all started with me gaining an understanding of how Saturn was being smeared and how everything was flipped in terms of everyone thinks Saturn is Satan, everyone thinks he's the god of human sacrifice, when it's actually the other way around. He has an enemy um, on the heavens that mythologically is known as one who smears Saturn, smears uh, Saturn's name, and that is Jupiter. Well, not to go too much into that, because most people think that Jupiter is the good guy on the heavens and Saturn is the bad guy when it's a really the other way around. Um, but before we get to that, um, that was what it started with me, how I got started into Q. Then I found out that Q had all these elements within the code, uh, how Q was saying to people how to react, like how to think about certain things because he doesn't really, or her, we don't know, right? We don't, they don't, you know, tell us what to think. They pretty much tell us to apply logic and they ask questions that lead us somewhere, of course, but as many conspiracy theorists, people already could see that these codes were leading to something that was substantial. That was just initial discussions, whether is this mind blowingly new revelatory um, and for a, a lot of people, it wasn't, you know, he was talking about Rothschilds and Clintons, like that was low level stuff for many people. And I thought so too. But when I really started to see the events unfold and how it was a military operation, some of you may not have, you know, gone into that yet, but then well, I saw that. And then it all started to, to click for me in terms of apply logic and think strategy and think awakening we have this is not for the awakened people and it suddenly dawned on me that this thing because it was doing the way it was doing it was you know going down in the level in terms of high level conspiracies and such it was much more detailed in terms of who pays who uh, who is organized with who and how do they move the things around it was much more detailed in that sense it was it was more in line with how intelligence officers would think in the field and that initially attracted me to, okay, so maybe because they're dumbing it down, it has to do with them wanting as many people to wake up to these things. And it was a, they, they started to, to label themselves as not as an awakening project, but more as a communication operation. It was a communication between mm -hmm. military back channel to the civilians out there who were able to, to learn their communication uh, sets and codes. And people know that about Q out there. So what is it that I am bringing to the table? Well, I've been engaged with Tartaria research for a while. I laid off all the human trafficking stuff, all the Pizzagate back in 2017. I had had enough and it was wearing me down. And I went into Tartary when that blew up because I saw that with that research, uh, it was more positively tuned towards uh, amazing things, new discoveries. We were feeling like little children again in, mm -hmm. that's, in that sense. And um, I, was, I was big on the community from the start. I saw Martin Liedke blow up and I started going into the archives and just, I, I spent two years all, every day, like even when I was, you know, doing something away with the family or every day I went into archives and looked at stuff. I just, looked up a random word I thought could have some meaning to something. And then I just took it from A to C. And I did that for two years. And that was two of my most incredible years of research. And I found stuff that, you know, I wasn't expecting to find. I wasn't, you know, looking for X, Y, and C. I just found amazing stuff. And so it felt like you were digging uh, as an archeologist, not knowing what you were gonna find. But you always knew that what, where you were digging was, you're going to find something. And I found something every day and I could send something to Martin every day. So all this Tartary research was just blowing off. And then in 2020, at just before the pandemic 
pandemic, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> just before that, I started to, I don't know exactly what, how it happened, but I just started to feel differently about Q. And I saw um, the news stories that got me was when Trump took charge over the treasury, bless you. <laughs> um, when I saw that, I thought, holy hell, that is the biggest financial news story ever, like ever since we, like in our lifetime. And only Yahoo News is like bringing this story and only in like two lines. And I was thinking, that is odd. Like that is really odd. Why aren't the MSM coming out and attacking this? Like, oh, Trump is taking charge over the treasury. Like they should be able to spin that somehow, but they didn't. They just they just left it. Um, and I and I found I thought to myself, holy hell! Like this was even predicted by Q. You know, he was he said like two years ago that the treasury was going to play this role and Trump was going to take it over. And then I I I found my first really really big confirmation of the narrative that Q put out. Um, and that started it all for me. And whilst I was doing that, I was researching Tatri with the radio. And so what happened was that in one of my radio shows I was doing with Ben, my colleague, and he was sending me a lot of stuff. And then suddenly this people appeared called the Q Celts. Mm -hmm. So these Celtic people, you know, we all know about Celts, but looking really at the how they designate different types of kilts we found out that there were these q kilts and these p kilts and then i saw in the q code that q was saying that they're saving p for last so i thought q and p and then i thought to myself logic well the most the two most commonly used letters as exemplary of formal logic is q and p if, if p then q and uh -huh. all these P's and Q's things yeah. started to, to, I just saw them everywhere suddenly. And I was thinking, holy shit, I need to, to, to put this into the narrative. I had to look up the letter Q and look for Tartarian symbolism and Saturnian symbolism. And when we did that, Ben and I, it just started to unfold. Like when we started to look for it, it was everywhere. And it started to really weird me out because like why why hasn't people seen this like why why are we the first one to notice these things and ben's theory was that well everyone hates saturn so they're not going to see this mm. um maybe but we saw that and we brought it out in the shows and it started to evolve more and more around kennedy and trump and i started to to look at their ancestry and i found out well they're both q celtics people like really strongly like q celts not P kilts, but Q kilts. And I said, well, it all fits. And then we looked into Tartarian links and we found that JFK uh, and Trump had been harping on Tartarian symbolism for a while. Like there's a photo of JFK just before he dies where he's feeding a deer wearing red slivers. Well, that's of note, but that deer is something the, the deer theme is something that has played throughout the kennedy clan uh, mm -hmm. political life they were i think jfk senior was gifted two spotted deers by some hotshot from asia or something and that was some really tartarian stuff going on because the deer in tartarian symbolism you you may have seen all these siberian shamans they always wear the deer uh, crowns right so the deer is massively symbolic for the Tatars, as well as the horse and as the sandal. And these three things was something that the Kennedys were really big on. And they, they were even, um, they had the dogs of Camelot. Well, Camelot is Arthur. Arthur is completely Saturnian symbolism. It's an embodiment of a Saturnian avatar. And Trump is an Arthurian knight. Uh, they're both from Scotland. Scotland is history goes back to Scythia. Um, Trump's Turnberry Lighthouse in Scotland on the golf course is literally a repurposed lighthouse as we would research it in the Tartaria community, like an old castle. And on that castle, they, they made an, a lighthouse after the mud flood era. And uh, Trump bought that. 
And it's basically like this whole castle is a story about how they repurposed a mud flooded castle that belonged to an ancient Tartarian king in Scotland that gave Scotland independence. So Trump wanted to, to have that symbolism around him. And no one has really talked about it. There were only a few Twitter handles that was pointing people in that direction. And they were doing that anonymously and without uh, overtly doing it. They were giving hints. They're like, look at this lighthouse. If you don't understand the lighthouse, you're not seeing it clearly yet. There's something really big here. And it dawned on me that whatever Trump was doing with this Turnberry lighthouse was to show us, the Tartarian research community, that he knew everything about that as well. That was my first idea, like, okay, so he's been following the Tartary research or he's trying to tell us something about it. And then I looked at the news stories. Well, then they called him the Tartan Trump. And Tartan literally is a word that comes from Tartary. It, it means, well, etymologically goes back to Tartary. So they were calling in the news headlines, they were calling Trump Tartary Trump. <laughs> so I was thinking to myself, holy hell. And then I went into to look up his ancestry more. It was not only Scottish, it went back to Rurik, the king of Kiev in the seven in the eighth century. And this line ruled Muscovy Tartary for 700 years. So that means that Trump's ancestors, pure ancestors, ruled Tartaria. It's the same ancestors as Putin. He has the same, he has the same blood. <laughs> and in 2012 or 13, Putin was seen on TV, maybe it's a little bit after, Putin was seen on TV with Tartaria maps. That was the first time in, I guess, ever perhaps on TV that maps of Tartary, the empire, was shown. So Putin, he spearheaded that. And knowing the blood relation, knowing how they've been, you know, seemingly been not the best friends, but yet then again, a little bit good friends. It's, it's hard to pinpoint their relationship. But they share blood and they both know that they share blood. And they not only, you know, it's, it's pretty strong. It's not that far removed from each other. Um, and all of this Tartary stuff that's coming out. And Trump is clearly showing people for those who see that, or for those who can see, that he's harping on this Tartarian thing. And only a few people are going to be able to recognize why that is important. So it's not something he's doing to, you know, sell himself, I think, because that's not going to be a good sell. Cost benefit is a little off there and no one has really noticed it. Um, <laughs> so I, I think he's really trying to let us know that he's all about the Tatri. And for me, that was massive because I thought to myself, Tatri, it represents everything Trump is talking about. World peace represents multiculturalism, just like America is, like a, a melting pot. It represents uh, true freedom, because what we found in, in the research was that all the American founders, especially Jefferson and Franklin, they were all Tartarophiles, meaning that they all loved great Tartary. And they were keeping it secret amongst themselves. Benjamin Franklin was, he had the bibliography of Genghis Khan, all the Khans, as one of the only guys in America at the time that he had it. And he had it copied and printed and sent to all his fraternal brothers. And Jefferson, he wrote in his um, memoirs, I think it was, but he has written it somewhere, that were it not for Genghis Khan and the philosophy of the Khans, or, and was it not for Great Tartary, America would never have had a concept of religious freedom that comes from Genghis Khan, religious freedom. So that, that was the idea of how the empire works. People have talked about Tartary as an empire, as a sovereign state, and it is, but they haven't been able to pinpoint the exact form of rulership it had. It's very specific form, something we have never seen in our lifetime, but still something you can find. It's called a suzerainty. It's with a C, S-U-C-E-R-A-I-N-T-Y, suzerainty. And it's not a sovereignty, because it's not a full-blown sovereignty. It is kind of like it, but a suzerainty is like an over-feudal state that was Tartary. And it had 
no vassal states as such. It was not controlling them 100%, but all their um, foreign affairs between other countries and members of the trade union, that, that would be handled by Great Tashri, the, the over-feudal state. But the internal disputes and the internal affairs of every, let's say, underlying state was handled by the, the own state um, with their own sovereignty. So it was like the over-feudal state was a world police in the true sense as America has sold itself today just in a very counterfeit way, right? Yeah. But it was a true world police. It would uphold true freedom, religious freedom, everybody, as long as their great law, which was natural law, wasn't broken, everybody was free to do what everybody wanted to do. And that's what we want on the international level. And Great Tatsuri were able to, to have a system like that where it was more like a trade union more than it was an empire. But there was an overarching authority, which was an entire country with citizens as well. And, and I find the concept fascinating, like truly fascinating in terms of history, in terms of politics, in terms of what Jisara and Nisara could really be and where it could come from, like the idea of Nisara and Jisara, I believe strongly that it is just Tatri they're trying to bring back. Okay. That's me... why all the technology in Nisara is so hugely important. All the patents of Tesla yeah. and how Tesla's father was a Tartarian priest, more or less. It all fits together and how Trump and Tesla and John Trump the, the technology aspect of it is just screams Tatri. And a lot of people had noticed that. For instance, I remember Martin Liedke n mentioning it. Like, that's pretty Tatarian. Like, uh, also, like how Trump, he said, like, in 2018, he, everybody thought he was joking when he mentioned airports in the 1700s in America, right? Mm -hmm. But literally all, all the Tatri researchers was going, hmm. <laughs> Like, what does he know? And then I, I got the confirmation. Like, he does know. He may be the entire reason why Tatari blew up back in 2017 and 16. I'm, I, I don't think it's unreasonable to think that at this point. But you may want to go in and watch some of my stuff before you take that on, just having listened to me now, right? Uh, <laughs> because... I could be bullshitting you, but I'm not. <laughs> okay, but before uh, yeah. we go further, there's a couple of things that you hit on that I kind of wanted to dig out a little bit deeper. Um, can you just, I, I know none of this is easy to explain quickly, but can you explain mm -hmm. to people what, who are they and what is the difference between the Q-Celts and the P-Celts? And then I'm gonna explain to you something interesting I found about them that I don't think, maybe you've got to, but I'm, I'm not sure. So go ahead. Okay. Interesting. Okay, well, um, the Celtic people, they all come from Tartary, like this, they say the Aryan birthplace in Asia. That may be a little bit incorrect. Well, that's the story. And these people had to, because they were growing too numerous back in Tartary, some of them had to migrate to Europe. Those who did that first were the Q-Cults. Okay. What they, they overtook Europe, they built all the cathedrals, they build all the star forts and they befriended, well, it's not true with all, sorry, because there was a, a Moorish people living there already in Europe. They befriended the natives and they were living in peace and harmony. Um, that is where you get your Basque uh, mm -hmm. people, I think is kind of a mix of the Turanian and the, the ancient Moorish stock of Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and that's also where you get all these... Uh, uh, tribe of Dan migrations from Bulgaria and up to Scandinavia. It, it, it's this Q-Celtic migration that came out of Tartary. The P-Celts, they came a centuries after and they were a little bit different. They're described that the, the Q-Celts are more described as being taller, more blonde, more reddish, okay. sometimes even brownish. Uh, they were like perhaps the old giants. And yeah. the P-Celts were a smaller stock they're ancient brothers living from, coming from the same place, but they were different and they had grown different after their brothers had migrated out of there. Uh, what they did was on their way to Europe, well, roughly, was that they made friends with uh, the papacy. 
okay. or the beginning priesthoods of the Jupiterian cults that wanted their peace in Rome. Because back then, Rome was not called Rome, it was called Saturnia, and was ruled by pew Celts. And they had a, a temple of Saturn on the Capitoline Hill, and now they moved it to another hill because Vatican took it over. Um, so the Q-Kills and the P-Kills, they're opposed not only in their languages. The Q-Kills, they retain the letter Q, the pronunciation of Q in their languages, most common consonant in, the, in their language. And the other ones, they rejected Q. They revised everything that had to do with the k, -k sound. Yeah. And they made, it, uh, they made it either into a P yeah. or an L or a, an S or a C. So uh, they, it seemed to me at the start that the P-Kilts had a disdain for the Q-Kilts because they wanted to, to do away with everything the Q-Kilts had done, especially in the language. And they teamed up with the papacy and they made war. The P-Kilts and, and the papacy made war against Arthur who was a Q-cult. And it's the same story with, you know, the early Romans making wars against the Druids. That's the P-cult versus Q-cult thing. Not told in that way, but if you're looking at the stock of the people and taking it back to Tartary, that's a way to, to index the fight, let's say. And I'll also say it's the same deep state versus white hat war we're seeing right now. The ancestors of all the deep state players, the big ones, are P-cults. They're these Farnese, Persian... Um, uh, papal families or Sini, uh, and then you have the Q Celts opposing them, and those families are more unknown, semi less known. Some of them are big. I would say Colonna family is one of them, and that's why there's been this feud between the Orsini and the Colonna family before. Um, but not to get too much into every detail of all of this, but yeah, the P Celts and the Q Celts. Okay. Different in their stature, and they were opposed to each other, made wars against each other. Okay. But so, they were anciently brothers. I'm glad that you, um, so a little earlier in the conversation, you had said the word etymology, so I knew you were a person that looked at language, because when Jeff started coming yeah. to me with your work, he, yeah, there's one particular thing that maybe we'll get into in the second hour that was the first thing he brought to me that kind of got me paying attention. And then the next thing was this Q Celts, P Celts thing, right? And when I went mm. looking into it, we found a very interesting research paper about the language, right? This woman is a language, mm. uh, what was kind of, she, she, basically, she was a, she's a linguist, right? And she was tracking mm. this replacing of the Q with the P, right? The, the basically, mm -hmm. the story she told is, like it wasn't anywhere near as detailed as what you said, but has some of those same components. And she said, basically, hers was though, a split happened with this split in language, that one portion, one faction just rejected the Q and, and replaced mm -hmm. it with the P. And from there, the cultures of these two factions of what had once been the same tribe seemed to begin to diverge immensely. And it all stemmed from language. They have different ideas mm -hmm. of gender, technology, mm -hmm. like all sorts of things, but that, and this is something sometimes hard for people to understand, but anyone who's done significant research into mind control knows how important language is in mind control, that the printing press was really the first advancement towards like MK Ultra style mind control, right? <laughs> so just yeah. changing one letter in a language can completely change the trajectory of a culture or a society. And that that seems to be the big, it, it sounds crazy to say that like a war that has gone on for centuries started over the changing of a letter, but that's actually yeah. in some ways exactly what it is, right? Yeah, but okay. well, yeah, and exactly she's right. It started with language. Like when looking at it like that objectively, it started with the language. I asked myself, but why? Why did they have to reject the Q, right? Why, why, why weren't the Q people interested in rejecting the P? What's your why was it only the P guilt? What? Do you have a theory on why that would be? Yeah, it was because the P are the Phoenicians. Okay. Um, and the, the Phoenicians, they are a, a vindictive people. Like everywhere I read about them, what they say about other people, is that they held well i maybe have to backtrack a bit because i was telling you about how 
the P kills and the Q kills were anciently brothers. Okay. Well, you have the 13 tribes of Israel, which would be a, a mix of P and Q in this sense mm -hmm. at that time, back in the day. Then something happens. There's the curse of Ham, um, you know, with the story of Noah. And some, what, there's the curse 13 tribe. There's one of the tribes that is not behaving according to natural law mm -hmm. and they want out. They want their own system and they want their own type of people and they want their own genetics. So what happened, I think, mm -hmm. was that uh, in Persia and around the Caspian Sea, a lot of the, from the line of Shem and a lot from the line of Ham were being mixed to create their own hybrid uh, because through the hybrid, they had no real roots they were a mixed identity so it was easier for the p celtic elite back then to form the phoenicians this was when the talmud came out and that was essentially okay. what it was yeah it, it was to form a new identity for this new breaking free from natural law this is prometheus breaking through the chains like they don't want saturn's chains they don't want that boundary of natural law so we'll do away with it and they thought they were the the chosen ones because they were different. They were unique. Everybody rejected them, right? Like the other brothers, they didn't want to kill them because they knew natural law. So what they did was they forced them out into the desert, much like in the biblical narrative, yeah. right? Yeah. And they were made to wander and uh, they became the wicked, the wicked wanderers that never slept because they were forced into living nomadically. But that's a little bit too rough as well. But because of that, the Phoenicians and the Picos, they learned shipbuilding. They took to the seas. They rejected the lands. They, say, they saw that their ancient brothers were masters of the land. They were masters of the horse. What they could do was trick and deceive and use the seas, where their ancient land brothers weren't as big. And it was all according to the astrology. Like these people were Piscean Mm -hmm. fish people they were jupiterian phoenician people so they loved the sea and their ancient brothers were, were earth-bound constitutionalists in that sense and god-fearing people they were earth and air much like saturn is so that's the you see how the saturn and jupiter conjunction is is something that is always going to set the stage for the power plays in the world and you can see how the enemies of any conflict will either be Jupiter and Saturn when it comes to the conjunction. And the conjunction is coming up this year, as many of you guys know, the, the winter solstice. And it's the first time in a long time that Saturn is going to be the one that's overtaking Jupiter. So that's why it's the big event. That's why astrologers such as Levette has been talking about 2020 before 2012. She knew back then that 2012 was not anything. She could read the heavens and saw there's no conjunctions of any importance. Then she fo fast forwarded eight years going through the Ethiopian calendar, which is eight years uh, out of sync. She fast forwarded and saw 2020 and saw all the numerous great astronomical events that's taking place. And especially the very unique one with Saturn overtaking Jupiter on the solstice while also having Pluto there. And it's on the solstice. So it's like, it's the most, it's the biggest event on the heavens in like perhaps a thousand years. And uh, this is what, this is this year. So that, that is why I am so strong in my conviction that the cure narrative is going to be forced forward now. Mm -hmm. Like we're living in the weeks where it's going to happen or not going to happen. Like there's only going to, like, after Christmas, if people are still having doubts as to whether the, the narrative is coming into fruition, then I'm also ready to lay it off because it has to be now. Um, it can only be now. It's the, the, the script in the heavens, it's always going to be like that. It's always been like that. And I, I, I think that is why Q has come out 2017, just its preparation for the conjunction. Uh, and that's why it's so heavily Saturnian. That's why the Jupiterians, they hate it. And that's why all my symbolic decodes centers around Saturn and Jupiter and how to, to see that dichotomy, because it is a true dichotomy. Um, what makes it complicated is that the Jupiterians' MO is to mirror Saturn. So they will play a false Saturn, just like uh, Sat uh, Satan masquerades as an angel of light. To confuse, the Jupiterians masquerade as Saturn 
much like the natives would use the ancient um, uh, swastika and associate bad actions to it and then flip it as well. That's what the Jupiterians do all the time. That's the only thing they do. It's their ultimate magical ritual. It has to do with patricide. They have, um, if, like Freud, the ultimate Jupiterian pedophile out there, yeah. the master psychologist that wants to normalize it, right? He was studying like these tribes in, I think, Africa, and he noted this patricide rituals where it was about killing the firstborn baby or killing of the, the father, the, the restrictive father. And a lot of these tribes were like cannibalist tribes and weird tribes. And Freud, he, he, he said that that was some sort of tribal instinct to act like this. We well, was being very selective, right? <laughs> and um, so it, it's all about this patricide rituals for these Jupiterians. Uh, they, they want to make Saturn appear bad, evil, or they want to outright mock him. And they love it when people such as us say Saturn is Satan out of this very uh, this singular phonetic similarity. It's the only thing they really have on it. Um, yeah. Because when you really dig into the alchemical symbolism, you can see that uh, nothing of the sort is, the, is true. Like Saturn is the ruler of the golden age. Saturn was the ruler of the spirit. Saturn instituted law and order. Like Jupiter has nothing on that. Jupiter, like if you read about Zeus, who is uh -huh. Jupiter in Greek yeah, mythology, yeah. Zeus was the big pervert. He fucked everything. He, he like he didn't care about uh, other people's laws. He was pretty aggressive. He had a fiery temper, and he would punish people, not always fairly. Like that's the story of Zeus, and that's why the Vatican they love him. Saint Peter is Zeus. Jupiter, um, if you look at South Park, you'll see they even say that St. Peter is the white rabbit. It's pretty full on. Like, wow. yeah. So fo follow the white rabbit. That, that is St. Peter. That is Jupiter. That's the white wow. rabbit. And um, it makes sense, right? Like I, I posted in my threads, like, don't act surprised. Like, we know, you all knew we were going to the Vatican eventually, but to say that St. Peter and the first Pope was literally the white rabbit. And also you can go back in history and see that that is just mind blowing that that hasn't been a center of focus yet. Like, because it, it's so obvious and everybody's going to accept that when they hear it, because we all know about the Vatican, even my he parents do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. A couple of things there. So real quick, back to the P and the Q right that, that, yeah. that because you said because they're the phoenicians right and so like the uh, one trick like the, the, this group of people understand the power of language right and mm -hmm. so by replacing q with the p it creates a different vibratory pattern in the cathedral which is the roof of the mouth and into the brain of people who speak that so it starts to reformat mm -hmm. their brain for how they understand language and how they understand reality and from the way you're describing the Phoenicians, I think we all understand the modern iteration of what you're talking about here. And if you pay attention, these people are in control of our media and in control of our understanding of reality. So I, that I think like they had to take it all the way down to the alphabet to begin building an entire historical narrative where people's frequency was out of kilter from what it once had been. Does that sound reasonable mm -hmm. to you? Okay. So well, it sounds it's spot on. Okay. So uh, like, way better than I explained it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. So then the next thing uh, I have to, I, I sometimes have trouble reading my own language. Right. So, and it's making me think about, cause you know, one of my criticisms of Q in the beginning had been that like, whenever anybody brought up the issues with Israel, they were just like, we'll deal with that later. Now, if I'm going to just jump out of my like uh, harsh, my, my sort of hostility towards Q and say, okay, well, if they have to explain on a certain level some of the history of this before they explain how that is rep like presently represented as the problematic group of people that are, re Israel is represented by now, that makes sense on a certain mm -hmm. level, right? Like you can't just start yeah. off screaming that Israel is a problem if the problem is it's complicated to understand. So I do get that. 
Then you said something about Q being forced forward now, right? And we're seeing mm -hmm. a forcing forward in the last several weeks like we haven't seen before with Bill Maher talking about Q with all these people. And I see them doing the exact same thing they did with Pizzagate, right? They're talking about mm -hmm. the absolute stupidest aspects of Q, period, mm -hmm. right? The one that is like designed to make everybody look stupid. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And also, um, also just like for even for people like when people whenever send somebody sends me something that is like oh you have to look at this thing about q right because they want me to get onto the q train it's always the dumb shit about how you know the, tom hanks is type or madonna's typewriter or tom hanks is typewriter or yeah. hillary clinton is going to be arrested next week and all of this kind of stuff which i just known from like years I've been doing this shit for a long time. The politicians and the celebrities are not going to be arrested. That is not really how this is going to happen. You know what I mean? And so whenever I feel like people's attention is being directed to that, it's a savior program, it's a waiting for somebody to, else to do something, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But in some ways it might be okay for that noise to be up there because meanwhile, you're able to be down here doing this other stuff. They want people to think Q is the other thing so that they don't think it's what you're talking about. And that's why they're feeling this need mm -hmm. to create a narrative about Q that everybody will sort of write, you know, write it off offhand because the media that mm -hmm. is pushing it are those Phoenicians you're talking about. This version of it are those Phoenicians you're talking yeah. about. Okay. And yeah. then I, the last thing I wanted to address and we'll go back to you was you were talking about this thing with patricide and killing of the firstborn, right? And one of the things mm -hmm. I've noticed um, because, you know, the machinations change over time, right? And you don't see maybe quite as much of this patricide as you saw back in more historical times. But what you do mm -hmm. see is a lot of firstborn children being sold into child trafficking, being sold into satanic mm -hmm. ritual abuse, being the child of the family that might be involved in MKUltra kind of experiments and things like that, right? Yeah. So it is a certain kind where, where a lot of these characters, activities that you're talking about are associated with these people like cannibalism like all this kind of stuff that all occurs in that environment so it's sort of a um they found a better use for the people than just to kill them or or, or to sacrifice them or whatever and that was to simultaneously do that and continue to use them for other things like uh, the ultimate in yeah. recycling not wasting anything right and i've heard exactly they're very efficient. Yeah. I heard you talking about this the other day, right? They're experts in effectivity, right? They don't just kill yeah. for the adrenochrome. They want the cerebral cortex fluid, the teeth, the eyebrow, all this kind of stuff. It, it, was, it was wasteful to just discard, to kill and just discard of them, correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's how they think. Okay. Yeah. That, right. that, 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 there's a method to the madness, right? And that, that's always been the hard part to get to. Like, how do these people truly think? And I think like what I'm getting to in the end, um, because I'm being led most of the time towards these conclusions, which sounds crazy and dangerous to many people, I know, but I am being led by anonymous people who sent me the most impeccable stuff and act stupid about it afterwards, which is really weird. Yeah. But no, um, that's exactly that, that's yeah, actually yeah. very smart. Very smart. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but that's how I get most of my data, the best data points I've gotten has been from most of these anons and who I love dearly, <laughs> but um, I'm piecing it together, right? They cannot do that for me. Um, and it's really, um, yeah, um, what, what, what was it that we wanted to go into? How um, you were on about something just before, I lost my thread now. I was talking about, so we talked about the vibratory patterns of the P versus the Q, pushing Q forward now, right? Like yeah. talk about the, you know, Phoenicians as the current day, issue with israel and then we were talking about we were talking about effectivity effectivity yeah, yeah their effectivity yeah yeah and how they want to not waste anything uh, yeah that that's definitely uh, an mo i'm seeing because the more deeper i go into it i see how they they want to use the plasma they want to use the blood and uh, this whole golf gate semex thing that mm -hmm. i based a lot of the q drops on and created um was about how they also use blood of people, not only children, but also adults, mm -hmm. to strengthen cement and possibly also to get, to put egregores into uh -huh. buildings, mm -hmm. possibly. So yep. the blood acts as a binder and also as a feeder for the entity for a while, so it can live there. And, um, you know, enact certain 
magical things. Like something I always noticed was that in courtrooms, when you walk in there, you'll see paintings and you'll see like marble uh, columns and you really pay attention um, and, you know, try to get out of the pareidolia thinking. I think you'll be able to see egregores and a lot of the architecture, like small little faces, entities, mm -hmm. certain things like that. Mm -hmm. It's definitely things I've seen before. Um, and I think it has to do with the blood and the cement thing. And that's what Cemex is most likely involved with, besides the just plain old selling children. Um, I think it's, it's specifically about plasma, putting mm -hmm. plasma and blood into cement brickwork to strengthen it. It's something that's um, actually found in world history. Like the London Bridge had to be put human sacrifice into the bridge Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it wouldn't hold. That, that was the idea. It was to stabilize it and strengthen it. They used mm -hmm. human blood. There's even patents from the 50s going into the 60s and 70s and 80s about how they could use blood in the most effective way to strengthen concrete, which is pretty fucking crazy. Like, they, they talk about using pig blood and cow and whatever, but when you know these people... Like, you know, we talk about eating meat as well, right? And some mm -hmm. go the whole way to eating humans. Like, in the same sense, <laughs> some talk about using pig's blood in the cement. Some Satanists would, might think, mm, let's use some humans because we're sick fuckers, right? So on, already there, you can say, of course, that would have been an idea from some sick Satanist at some point. And then also, apparently, it was also useful. So that's a two and two for these people. So, of course, they're going to do it when it's useful. And they're probably going to think ritualistically about, you know, sacrificing people because that's what they do. And to me, it seems also quite impersonal about, you know, the sacrifice. Like, even if they were to sacrifice something that all the members hated, they would still be quite impersonal about it, I think. Yes, we're just sacrificing you. Okay, are you, sh are you, are you going to be quiet about it? <laughs> like, uh, they're quite impersonal about it. Like, it's a, it's a way for them to just have their religion. It's normalcy to them. And that's what it's hard for us to put our mindsets in. It's also normalcy for them to have this divide where they, we cannot tell them these things. And, you know, there is this, uh, you can know the truth, you cannot know the truth. It's also normalcy for them. And it's very easy for them to, to walk in that system because you cannot tell people these things either way. So it's, it keeps itself yeah secret right it, yeah it's, um, it's, it's it's impossible to believe and so you don't even have to work hard to try and hide it exactly so yeah. that's also why they grow you know arrogant and ballsy in terms of they don't fear you it's something q says repeatedly they don't fear you they show their symbolism openly and q has also said something that was quite remarkable because in all of this q was talking about indictments and putting them to jail but Q always said in terms of their real downfall is coming from symbolism, not yeah. from being put into jail, but symbolism will be the real downfall. And always made me think a lot, like, why is symbolism, like, really? Just symbolism? Uh, own, uh, is that the necessary and sufficient cause to bring down the whole uh, deep state? Well, okay. Well, if he's saying it, let's try and roll with it and see what we can find. And what I did was only focus on the symbolism and then I went into the Cemex and the golf stuff and, well, I'm not even done. I, I don't even feel like I'm 10% done with all of that. And I've created three Twitter threads now that perhaps it will take like four hours to read through, like all of it. Uh, and it, it just keeps on going. Like it's, it's truly mind blowing how this map of symbolism Q is also talking about. He talks about learn to read the map and built the map. And it has to do with this map of symbolism that they use. It's really, really consistent, as we have already seen with, you know, Pizzagate. And, but when you really go down to like the big codes, the backbone of the structure, it's not the restaurants that's the backbone of their structure. That's an added bonus for them. The backbone of the structure is golf courses, ports, um, cement concrete factories, and the churches. And uh, also the big infrastructure lines, like uh, big waterways, train stations. Those are the real backbone industry. That's their organization. That's how they organize the traffic. So that's the most important thing. 
um, and the codes used in that section of their ball game is different, and people haven't looked too much into it. Well, mostly because people weren't thinking that it could be that organized or that, you know, extensive. All of this, but it, it truly is. And I went into the golf stuff and the cement stuff, and I created these Twitter threads, and it led me to this certain Q code that was talking about Stringer. It's like this thing that's known in Q that's called Stringer. It's the specific, like 10 drops that's talking about Stringer, which is, what, from what I could find, is a freelance journalist, a Stringer is, and they are ordering the citizen investigators to look at this AIDS video Obama has made. And that all came out of the cement and golf gate thread that I made. And I was thinking there's a link between cement and golf and Q has talked about it and hinted towards that and no other researcher has picked up on it. Here am I trying to find the new gate, like pizza gate, Merfer gate. Uh, Everything has to be a and, gate, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it has to be a gate because the, Q also talks about uh, doors, like gates and doors and how POTUS is going to open a door, the door of doors. And I think that has to be like a gate, like a pizza gate or... Um, and I, I, I'm thinking now that the golf gate scenario is, is going to become part of the narrative eventually because Q has said in the drops about golf that it's not important yet, but it's going to be. And that means that, well, I've already broken that gate, explained it, how it fits together, even with all the symbolism. And it led, me, it led to these posts with Stringer that's talking about looking at uh, this AIDS video Obama has made. And it seems to me that Q knew that someone was going to break out this golf gate thing through these threats or for, through these Q posts. And when that was done, that guy or the people who knew that or found that was going to re-see those codes and find that Q was also talking about this AIDS video that Obama was, had, had made and how that was all gonna tie into what you have already decoded. And I spent some time looking for this video and I, could, I thought it was something that might be coming in the future. Like now you've done this, so this is gonna come and you're gonna be one of the only ones who's gonna see it and know about it because you, you have decoded this, so only you know. But I found out that the video was posted in the past. And what blew my mind was that the video and the news story towards this AIDS was all about golf. And that was not alluded to in the Q drops. So basically, without me detailing it too much, Q validates the golf gate. And only through my work and these specific Q codes can you see it. But I can prove it now. Q is validating the golf trafficking stuff and the cement trafficking stuff. It's always been there in the Q codes, but people needed the symbolism more than anything to be able to decode it. The astro the esoteric symbolism, the occult symbolism. And not a, a lot of the Q decoders out there are more into like the military side of it, like the dates and when is this gonna happen? And that's not important or interesting for me. Yeah. Because that's secondary. If it's gonna happen, it happened. And then we can look back and see, was it predicted? Well, great, right? It's, it's more important about how the symbolism works and how we can build the map of their sim because Q says that symbolism is going to be the downfall. And Q has also said that the truth must be discovered organically. They cannot tell us. And it seems to be like some sort of rule to that in terms of how this, if this awakening is going to be organic and not steered as a psyop, then we must discover it organically, right? Yeah. Okay. That's what, that's what, yeah, so that's okay. what, where I'm going to leave it. <laughs> you just said a lot of stuff there. Um, and yeah. so, all right, I'm trying to think up. First of all, this thing about the, the blood and the plasma is interesting, especially considering we've had a Trump plasma controversy in the last couple of weeks, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, we always, you know, like, where does all this blood and plasma that people donate go? Right, like where does it all go? They always have like blood drives. Like remember after the Las Vegas shooting, there was like the big blood drive. Why? The people that were dead were already dead and everyone else was alive. Why? You know, yeah. but 
when people go and donate blood when they're scared, it's emitting a different frequency or a different sort of hormone, which may be more mm. desirable for some of what you're talking about here. Um, it actually has to do with the hydrochloroquine, the plasma stuff, uh, and adrenochrome. It all ties together. And it's really, this is, this is what this AIDS thing is about, that Q asked Stringer to decode. This is what okay. it's all about. And it came from the golf stuff, which is when you it's say, truly saying, remarkable. You're saying golf, right? The game golf, not golf like the, the golf. Game. The game golf. No. Right? Yeah, but yeah, that's yeah, a phonetic right. homophone. The golf, the golf of Mexico ties into the golf yeah, gate stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And okay. that is through the Crenshaw family, if you know that one. Okay. Like the Dan, like Dan, like Dan Crenshaw? Mm-hmm. He's a bad guy. No, I know. I, I think that in, in the second hour, I think you and I can have some interesting conversation about how, how all this connects to Unity 2020 and, and, and what's going on there, because I've been observing that for a bit, and I have a lot of thoughts uh, about what's going on there. Um, can you just, I, the, the, the arc of your new work has gone into this heavy focus on Cemex and, and, and golf, right? Can you just, I, I know it's hard to do in a little, a little ways, but I'm, I'm hoping to pique people's interest so that they can go listen to what you're saying here. What, how did you get on to this Cemex issue? What is its connection to golf and why is, you sort of said why it's important yeah. before you told us how you came across this and what the connection is. Well, yeah, the first connection, I saw was through my staff board research. That was where it all started. That's two years ago before I was a Q-tard. What <laughs> research? Say. What research? Uh, staff board. Staff board. Stafford. Stafford. Okay. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's th these fortifications that are uh, shaped as stars that are everywhere. Starboard. Okay. And, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And me or my good, very good friend, a big shout out to 13th Monkey, who is possibly the most uh, number one staff board researcher out there. He's mapped thousands of thousands I've assisted with that was what we were spending all the times on two years ago mm -hmm. and we noticed that a lot of places where star forts were supposed to be that we could see from old maps now there was a golf course there huh. or now there was a cement plant there huh. and we know we knew that how these Phoenicians they work in terms of the Tartaria stuff they see some old Tartary structures they repurpose them they Phoenicify them with you know, uh, they put plaster work in, in, on top of the facades. They make new facade work to make new symbolism. Mm -hmm. And then they repurpose it. And then they love to use how the old Tatars holy sites with all the electromagnetic ley lines and stuff. They love to make their desecration rituals in these places. Mm -hmm. So the, these old magnificent buildings, the, they are the, 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 the spots for the rituals because that's where you're going to create this energy that's going to mock their ancient ants, uh, you know, ancient enemies. And it's also deeper than that. But that was where it all started with the golf courses and the star forts. And we knew that when we saw a golf course, well, possibly that could be a star fort or mounds below it. Right. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we knew implicitly that golf courses could mean tunnels, could mm -hmm. mean underground stuff. Yep. That was the first thing. So then I fast forward to Q and I see some X and how they're putting blood into the concrete. There was something that one, some of my Tatari research friends were telling me about two years before. How, how, did, you like get, was how did you realize that? How did you realize they were putting blood in the concrete? Well, my good friend Amaro two years ago told me that he showed me the patents, literally, right. that they were putting blood to strengthen right. them. And we were talking about how that could tie in with Tatari research and the red bricks that we see all around us. Yes. Now, I'm, I'm not so sure that all red brick are infused with blood. Don't be worried. But uh, right. we, we cannot see on the brick whether there's blood in it. That's the whole thing. But people were go taking it too far with the color red and blood and yeah. red brick. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, that was where I got my keys from. And then two years later, I'm into Q. I see the Cemex stuff. And then I look up some X plants, right? And mm -hmm. I, find an, I find some articles about it. A guy, he sends me an article after um, I go into golf and trafficking, like just on a, uh, as an investigative journalist. I look up golf stories about where there have been murders, human trafficking, prostitution. That was quite a lot. Like there were some, mm -hmm. some, some old Cambridge studies that, into human trafficking that was t talking about how the mafia, especially in Asia, like the... Um, the, the big mafia players, they would buy up 
golf courses and repurpose them as sex tourism spots. Oh, so I already knew back. I oh, already knew independently no. that golf courses with elite access was a big mafia, um, a big mafia magnet for mm -hmm. sex tourism setups, mm -hmm. right? So that in itself, golf could mean sex tourism. And then I knew that Cemex and the concrete plant in themselves could mean plotting concrete and human trafficking. We have already seen this news stories. So I knew that. And then suddenly a guy, he comes and he sends me this article. He says, I couldn't find this article, but after seeing your stuff about golf, I remembered reading this article two years ago and I couldn't find it. And then I found out they had censored it. So I had to use the Wayback Machine. And he found this article that showed a guy going on Google Earth and noting all the Cemex locations and how they were basically, mo the majority of them were neighbors to golf courses. So he was like, what? Like, so, so, so golf courses and concrete fa plants, in many cases, are neighbors. Can I like literally, some even share address. Can I ask you a yeah. question? Is the Cemex plant that yeah. you discovered in Tucson, Arizona next to a golf course? Uh, I don't think, no, that one is not. So it's not everyone. Okay. But if you go into if you Cemex, California, Long Beach, you'll find eight golf courses around it. Um, and it's not only golf courses; it's also airports and highways. So you find this uh, pattern of highway, airport, golf course, concrete plant. That is that is the most common uh, uh, the most common setup. You'll mm -hmm. find other things as well that is not as common, but definitely it ties into it. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the airport and the golf and the concrete plants, th those okay. are the big three. Mm -hmm. And in Orange County, in Torrance and in, in California, right Long Beach. Right where, the, where I am, yeah. Yeah. So you have your Cemex plant down at Long Beach. It's a huge one, right? Okay. Then you have the Trump golf course a little off the beach. And then you have another golf course down the other way. And you have uh, two airports. Yeah, I think you have three in the whole area, one little and two big ones. Yeah. Those two big airports, they have two golf courses each as their neighbors. One is a Navy SEAL golf course. Right? And it's also right by SEAL Beach. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Dan Crenshaw is a Navy SEAL. Yeah. And the Navy SEALs, they have massive charities playing golf all, all year. Like they have this Trident Cup even. And... Um, that may not be significant for people not knowing that, you know, you have charities and golf that could be a two big uh, red alarms for human trafficking. That is how people need to think now. Uh, that's what I'm for. That's what my work will force you to think about. Not to assume that everybody having a charity to do with golf is a bad guy, but definitely it is a cause to dig if those players are big players or connect to some, you know, scumbags, right? Uh, and the Crenshaw family is all about, uh, well, not only golf, but the golf also down at the sea and politics, law, the maritime side of yeah. it, right? And uh, Navy SEALs, military, especially Navy. And Dan Crenshaw's father is an expert in deep sea operations. It's all about the water. Yeah, like uh, yeah. like, like uh, his, uh, his other peoples in other Crenshaws in Texas are uh, involved with water treatment plants. There was another Crenshaw politician who had cla who received classified information about the water department in America. Uh, there's another Crenshaw who is involved with concrete and with oil drilling. And uh, after Hurricane Harvey, I think in Texas. There were like three different Crenshaws that came together independently and helped the city clean up the water situation. It's all about the water with the Crenshaws. Huh. And uh, the original bad Crenshaw was a pirate, literally a pirate, oh, like I, Dan Crenshaw. I, okay. I, I, yeah. could fun, so, I could have fun with you all day because that was going to be, I was going to go there with the pirate thing. Okay, very good. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Let's do this. Let's, let's take... Because I think, like, we have, like, for the people that can follow along, we have sort of a narrative going here. I think let's take a break and move over into the patron's hour. I have some things I'd like to talk to you about tennis. This is a kind of similar thing to golf, right? Tennis, maps. We can talk about maps. I would like to talk to you about 
uh, deep sea, underwater, maybe even underwater breathers. Uh, I'd like mm. to talk to you, uh, underwater breathers. I'd like to talk to you about hexafluoride layers. I'd like to talk to you about mm. a bunch of interesting stuff that sort of crosses over in a lot of points. So um, I think we'll switch over to the patrons hour now. Before we go, let people know where they can find your work, Victor. Okay, well, yeah, first and foremost, well, thank you for listening out there. Uh, for you not going to go onto the Patriots, shame on you. But uh, <laughs> I, you can find me on uh, YouTube, uh, the Booger Man. I'm heavily shadow banned, so you might need the link. Uh, people cannot it. find me just by stretching. Yeah. Um, on Twitter, I'm also the Booger Man, but that would the Twitter handle is Big T and then B U W G E Man. Uh, but the Booger Man, you'll find my handle with a boar, like a crest with a boar. Um, you know, a wild boar. <laughs> and um, yeah, so Twitter on, and YouTube and on Facebook, I'm just my my legal name, Victor Booger. Um, B-U-G-G-E and Victor with a C. Um, so yeah, that's where you can find me. And then YouTube, the last thing, because yeah. you mentioned her a couple of times, can you just tell people where they can find Lavette's work? Lavette on YouTube. Um, that's just Lavette channel. L A V E double T E. Lavette. Okay. All right. Excellent. Yeah. We're going to move over to the patrons hour. You can join us at patreon.com forward slash off planet media. I think this one ought to be a doozy. Jeff Gates will be joining us in the second hour. We will see you guys later. All right.